everybody. How you doing? I am Johan. That is Charleston joining us today on Better With Age. This man, uh, we call him Mr. Winnipeg. Uh, Legendary. Legendary. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Mr. Winnipeg. This guy was a CFO All-Star Canadian that uh, really uh, was one of the, I loved watching him, even though I'm a Margo fan. Grew up here in Saskatchewan. This guy had a fantastic uh, CFL career and now is one of the most... I would say entertaining uh, men in Winnipeg that you can find, Mr. Doug Brown. How are you doing today, Doug? Oh, pretty good, especially with the news that came across our uh, doorstep today. So a little smile crawled across my face, and uh, things are looking up, hopefully an end to this pandemic situation. Yeah, it's, Everyone it's nuts, is. man. Pe people oh. seem like people feeling imagine, good. Missing a season because of this, right? Like, whoever thinks... Your years are so limited in pro football, and you just have one disappear. Yeah. You know, and this to be cut down and, and shortened. Uh, it's just crazy. It's, it's absolutely surreal. And you know what? Everybody here in Saskatchewan says we blame everybody from Winnipeg for winning the Great Cup. All Everything went to hell after they won the, the, the Great Cup. The pandemic hit. That's why Winnipeg doesn't win the Great Cup all that often to be able to do that. But Doug, you know, yeah, what they said, it'd be a cold day in hell if Winnipeg wins. Yeah, and yeah. boom, whole, yeah. whole pandemic. We broke the world. We broke the world. Yeah. <laughs> How was? Watch out. Watch out if they go back to back. They're going to get real scared. Oh, well, man. That's the one thing I want to ask is how was that party in Winnipeg <laughs> once they won? I don't even remember. That was like 15 months ago. Um, <laughs> it was so long ago. You know, it was interesting because I was doing a lot of uh, coverage for, for CJOB as, as the color guy for the radio uh, radio show for the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. So um, obviously more uh, – Main and Portage, there was a, a big uh, parade of vehicles. And then uh, just watching, you know, the highlight, I think, for me was, uh, A, the fans, the turnout they had, the, the number of people that that went and uh, were affected by the championship but went to the parade and, and interacted with the players. I mean, that was, uh, that was incredible. And then, obviously, seeing the players in that element, especially the tenured ones, the guys that had – had been around Winnipeg for a while, played for the team for, for a while and understood what this means uh, to erase that drought and uh, uh, put the championship lore back uh, in its rightful seat with the, the, with the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. So, yeah, it was pretty crazy. Special time, but it seems like forever ago. <laughs> yeah. yeah, it really do. I think that was 15 months ago, man. I mean, you, you forget that it even was a great cup, but, yeah, because you just <laughs> took a whole year off. And like you said... I mean, I, I forgot about it, honestly, because you got whooped on by Winnipeg. So <laughs> <laughs> you just got to take it on the chin. But missing a whole year of football like that, just like you said, especially for a guy like me, that's an older guy. I'm kind of on the back end of my career when it comes to playing. And I don't have many more years to, to get out there and kind of give it my all. And I kind of want it, to. It was scary because you're thinking the whole entire time during this pandemic is like, I didn't think my career was going to end like this. I thought my career was going to end, you know, with a good rainbow over top of the field and then me running out, you know, like with the cameras rolling and then I could just drop the mic and then walk away from the game happy. But through a whole year and then watching uh, uh, the flu pretty much shut you down, shut your career down. And now I, I watched a whole bunch of guys like online talking about, man, I could just cry right now. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's a big news today, right? Obviously, we'll, we'll talk about with Doug about how the reaction is for, for everybody in Winnipeg. But uh, first, Charleston, what's your first reaction to the news today? Now, you were telling me earlier, he's like, ah, oh, shit, I got to go train. I got to do cardio. I got to yeah, do that. Yeah. <laughs> what was your reaction? Uh, I mean, how excited I, are you? I was pretty excited, man, and I was, I was pretty overwhelmed. But like I said... When when that one thing happened, now now it's kind of relief, a relief type feeling. But now you got to kick it in the gear. Now you got to start getting ready for the season. Now I got dates and stuff to start getting the line. I got three weeks to figure it out. Yeah. <laughs> and I know it's a lot of other guys that's like that. Doug, what's been the reaction in, in Winnipeg? Like, have you seen? Have you talked to any of the guys in in the Bombers or or seen some of the reactions online from these guys? Obviously, excitement, but. 
Yeah, I think the big thing will be everyone is now eagerly anticipating the schedule that's going to be out tomorrow, right? So that's that's the big thing is everyone's like, okay, that's fantastic, awesome. Everyone's celebrating. Uh, it's a pretty enthusiastic uh, response uh, on all social media platforms in terms of uh, Canadian football returning. However, uh, you know, now it's okay. It's 14 games. It's trimmed down. Who are we playing? When, where, openers, so on and so forth. And now the discussion begins. We'll have to ask Charleston this. Uh, I guess... Winnipeg Blue Bombers are still the defending champions, right? Is that how it works? Even when there's a year where there's <laughs> no man, no, it's reset. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> they can't come back and, and start celebrating. Like, yeah, we won last year. Let's go back to back. No, 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 no. <laughs> you gotta, you gotta hang the things on the raft. I mean, it's an outdoor stadium, so I don't know about the rafters, but you gotta, you gotta hang banners and you gotta have your. It's the championship yeah. afterglow. The Bombers never got last time, and. Honestly, I think all players, Charleston included, should be able to submit in writing to the CFL what your stat sheet would have been last year. You should be able to tell this. <laughs> oh, hey. man. You are, I would say 30. <laughs> now, I would have 12 sacks, you know, 47 tackles, probably, you know, bonuses and retroactive pay, all the time that should come into place. But yeah, all at of least, it. At well, least you should be afforded your statistics from a season they took away from you. If you're a veteran player, you're on the verge of going to the Hall of Fame and, and uh, a multifaceted all-star player, you can't just fall off the map for a year. They owe you something, right? So Yeah, man. I like I that, guess, man. I like that. I, I like, like this that. idea. This, this, we'll call this the, <laughs> as, the asterisk Doug Brown idea. Yeah, we're going to see if we can have this and be able to come up with the supposed uh, proposed um, statistics for the COVID year, the Doug Brown theory here yeah, idea. The phantom, yeah. phantom stats. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So I'll, I'll, have a, I'll have a round table of other veteran players and we'll take applications from Charleston and we'll be like, uh, no, you wouldn't have had 28 sacks, but we'll give you 16. You know what I'm oh. we'll, we'll off on it. We'll sign off on it. And then, then it adds to your, yeah. <laughs> I like that idea. I like, I like, I like, that where, idea. I like where your thought process is in this whole situation, man. <laughs> Doug, tell me about what you thought about the whole process. Now we're at the end. We can see the light with tomorrow being you know, the announcement of the schedule. But what were your thoughts, um, you know, six months ago? What were your thoughts nine months ago when everything was going on? Were you impressed by the CFL and how things were being rolled out? Were you disappointed? What did you think about how things were handled by the commissioner in the CFL? Well, I'll tell you what I didn't like. I, I absolutely hated the whole XFL talk and, <laughs> and uh, interlude. I was like, where did this come? All of a sudden, <laughs> we're worried about the CFL getting back on track and resuming and playing again. And then I'm hearing, oh, my God, they need the XFL to prop them up. And I was like, I didn't know there were problems to this extent until all of a sudden The Rock told me so. And, uh, you know, I really was not a big fan. Of, I honestly think this season, you know, you know, those uh, that saying you don't know what you've got till it's gone kind mm -hmm. of thing. And yep. I, I think uh, I think it's going to be a massive season for the Canadian Football League, just in a sense that it got taken away from everybody. Uh, so not only do the players appreciate it more and the coaches, but the fans, fans realize what life is like without the Canadian of Canadian Football League uh, going on in this uh, in this great country. And I think, obviously, there's going to be limitations and such initially, but hopefully by the later point of the season this year, I think you are going to see an appreciation for this league and what it does. And, and now that people know how quickly it can be taken away and how precarious the, the Canadian Football League financial situation is, uh, I just think uh, hopefully there's such a response in 2021 that it just erases any talk of us requiring a merger in order to survive going forward. And that's one of the things I think that, Charleston, you can tell us. I mean, you know, Doug brings up that great point. Where the fuck did we come up with this notion that the CFL wasn't good enough, that we needed help from this? But I understand the financial problems that the league has always faced. And, you know, there's a gate revenue um, generating industry and that the league needs the fans in the stands. But we've been trying to be able to... I guess the CFL, I can't say we, you guys have been trying to be able to find ways. And now I think with COVID, hopefully 
the league is going to start or the CFLPA. I know you guys. Are you guys finding, Charleston, other ways to come up with revenue or is there the gambling um, bit that might come into it? How has COVID changed um, anything in that regard? Um, I think it changed a lot, man. Just like you said, it should be some kind of, you know, you hear it a lot when people say about the CFL and, you know, the problem is, is, you know, they have a, they have an older crowd. They attract the, the older crowd. They don't know how to get in touch with the younger population yeah. and the younger base. But I think just like Doug just said, um, with what just happened right now, this is probably something that will get to that younger crowd now where now we can start to build, build a bigger fan base with, you know, a different type of crowd that we normally don't get in the CFL. But when it really comes down to it, I mean, that XFL, man, I, would, I didn't believe that one bit. I was just like, <laughs> you know what? To me, that's kind of clickbait. And they're just trying to raise some kind of hurrah or hype about something. But, I mean, if it happens and if it comes down to that and, it, and it's, a, it's a smart decision or business plan, I mean, I don't, I don't mind it. I'm not against it. But at the same time, it's one of those things where it's like, how about we focus on what we need to do internally first before you start reaching out to other, you know, leagues and, you know, that failed multiple times already and bringing a, a bad business partner into a business that's bad. Yeah. You're, not, you're not doing nothing good for yourself, right? You're supposed to attach yourself to something that's bigger or better than you to, make, to bring you up, right? But that's kind of how I look at it when it comes down to that XFL stuff, man. It's strange. Yeah, and, and Doug, what was your thoughts with as that? You're a Canadian. You grew up, you know, BC boy. You, you had that uh, goal. You played Simon Fraser University. You went down to the NFL. You came back up, right? You're, you're, uh, what were your thoughts on the XFL's proposal? Well, all this talk about possibly maybe canceling the Canadian ratio or, you know, all these different things that all these different ideas that people are throwing out there. Oh, we don't want the three downs anymore. We want it to be four downs. And you'd, you'd see the U.S. people come up with these different ideas. They want the XFL rules. And then the, the CFL has been around for 100 years. How could you take that away or the smaller fields are proposing? What were your thoughts when you were coming up or reading this on social media and, and reading all this stuff about the merger? <clears throat> Yeah, no, it really pissed me off. Like, I couldn't believe they just threw out the, the history and the tenure and the legacy of the game. And uh, we were being dictated to by the terms of the, the XFL, right? I was like, I was like, Vince McMahon is known for fake wrestling, right? Pro wrestling. And uh, he didn't work out as an owner. And The Rock is the same guy, if you ask me. I mean, you tell me the rock has more money than Vince McMahon or like, uh, granted he's partnered with a different group, but it's the same spin. It's a different take, but it's the same ingredients on, on that league that has never worked out. And I just hated the positioning of it. I, I hated hearing, you know, that the XFL was going to be dictating terms because they had the, the financial staking and backing. And, and I was just like, this Canadian Football League has been around for so long. It's been around when it was bigger than the National Football League, right? And it's just so storied, and the Grey Cup is it's the most accessible professional sporting league in the world. And to just hear all of a sudden, because a season was missed, that you know the Canadian Football League was on the brink of nothingness if they did not you know, cede to the demands of the XFL – led by a guy that didn't even make the practice squad of the Calgary Stampeders. <laughs> I was just like, I, didn't, I mean, I love the rock as an actor in, in Hollywood, but he doesn't have, he has as much experience as I do as in terms of running a, a, a sporting league. So <laughs> I, I didn't, I didn't get it at all, man. I hated going down that lane and, and just even having them as, as equal partners. I understand that they want to explore and, and go through all these different avenues and see, hey, can we make the game better? But at what cost? That's all I want to know. If you're going to take away, if you're going to strip this game bare uh, to, to make it more uh, uh, amenable to uh, American fans and, and make them feel better about it, I, I don't know. The, the American fans, as far as I'm concerned, are interested in the National Football League, and that's about it. So I think trying to squeeze in another hybrid league in America, you know, I don't know. The CFL works because of what it does in Canada 
with the makeup and the ingredients that it has going on up here. I, and I, That's why I said I, I couldn't understand it. It's just a strange move. You don't know whether it was a desperation attempt or whether it was just, you know, something to just kind of stir the pot up a little bit. But whether it was a good business move or a desperation attempt, who knows? Well, that's <laughs> the one thing that's frustrating for me as a fan, right? I, I've been trying to understand where the commissioner has been going. First off, it was this global plan. Hey, we're going to focus on Germany. We're going to focus. <laughs> watch Doug's face. Watch a global <laughs> plan, right? <laughs> you do it. And then, you know, and then all of a sudden it's like a squirrel runs across and he's like, oh, hey, XFL. Okay, here we go with this. And then, oh, hey, let's do this draft in Europe. Hey, oh, hey. It's just, oh, I was trying to figure out why is he trying to, it, it, you know, focus on all these different shiny objects to be able to do that. And, and, and then, when it came to, you know, the proposal for the Canadian government, um, you know, it, it didn't seem like anybody was organized. And it was just another shiny thing that he was trying to throw out there for the public. And then to do that, and we've talked about this on previous shows, um, Doug, is the passion that a lot of you former players have. John Bowman was pissed off that, you know, that um, how the league was taking it. No communication during this COVID, right, Charleston? I mean, to do that. Will Johnson last week was pissed off at how there wasn't more involvement from, you know, the CFL office to the, you know, PA and to the fans and let everybody know. So it, as a fan, it's been frustrating for myself is to be able to hear all these different directions, right? But, you know, you could see it. Oh, <laughs> Doug's expression there with, you know, the commissioner. What was your thoughts on how he has handled his job? And will we get Doug Brown running for commissioner in the next uh, CFL? <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> We've got guys like Will Johnson said last week, uh, you Mish. know, he, he would love to be able to do something, you know, like that. He's got backings with guys. With um, James West, he said he still talks to, you know, out there. And you can see it in your guys' passion, Doug. Um, but, you know, do we need somebody like that to come up and, and kind of step into where the commissioner has failed? Yeah, I mean, I totally agree with a lot of what you said. I mean, there were times I'm just like, he's throwing stuff against the wall and seeing what sticks, yeah. you know. And it just doesn't, uh, for a league, I, I don't know. You know, especially a former player and stuff too. I think I think Randy Ambrosi has done um, had some successes. Obviously, I think he's had some failures on a, on a grand stage as well. Uh, unfortunately, you know that presentation um, to the government without having player involvement. Mm-hmm. It's a lot of things that uh, you know contradict each other in terms of him being a former player and and things we've heard him say about involving the players and then there's exhibit a of the players not being involved. So I, I think a lot of uh, alumni, um, you know, and, and tenured veteran players like, like Charleston, they just, uh, we understand how important the league is and, and how great a game it is and how special and unique it is. And you just don't, you just want people to stop messing it up. Mm. Like just get out of the way. I mean, you, you don't necessarily want to use the, the a cliche that if it's, not broken while you're trying to fix it. We understand there are things about the Canadian Football League that need to be fixed, but uh, not to this extent and not to this scale uh, that they've been uh, attempting to do. Every single franchise in, in the Canadian Football League at some point or another, largely probably outside of Toronto, has been very successful at some point. Every single franchise, every single team in the Canadian Football League at some point or another was run the right way, was able to strike a chord and resonate with its fan base uh, to the point where they were very successful. So you know it can be done. It's just having them all happen at the same time, right? Having all this, all these ownership groups uh, that are competent operating at the same time. And like I say, we've seen it happen. It's hit or miss. And, and there's always just, you know, it seems like 70 to 80% of the teams are are very consistent or do very well but but unfortunately there are other teams that are that are problematic and uh, you just think it's always an overreaction though when you hear a lot of the the sequences and and storylines we've seen in terms of what they're doing it's almost like canceling the 2020 season gave them too much time to come up with new ideas <laughs> for what do. you know what i'm saying i'm just like whoa you know what happened to everything so let's uh, let's go baby steps. I, I liked it better when we were talking about having a team in Atlanta, Canada. Yeah. Right? Like it was just, I'm like, where did that go? What that all of a sudden 
Yeah, and then sort of interrupt. <laughs> yeah, so that that was the driving push, right? Atlantic schooners were this close, I thought, to yeah. be able to come on. on. They, were were, supposed, they were supposed to jump into the league in 2022. Or, you know, it was close, and that was yeah. the next, that was the 10th team, right, <clears throat> that was coming in, and we were close. I was pretty excited about stadium. that, too. You yeah. were going to do a game, which the Riders, no, yeah, the Riders were going to play Toronto in in Halifax, I think. It was yeah, supposedly. Halifax, Moncton. Yeah, yeah. And, and so, like, I mean, where did that go? That's a great point, Doug, and to be able to see that, too, all of a sudden now we have this. So it's going to be an interesting, I guess, next few weeks to be able to find out where we're going with that and... And obviously right, yeah. the schedule. It rolled out a lot of information on us in one day. I'll <laughs> yeah. tell you that much. <laughs> <laughs> Your head's spinning to be able to do that. Head well, we're spinning. just going to, uh, um, Doug, we're going to take a little bit of a commercial break. But once we get back, we'd love to be able to get into a few dying questions like, what was it like to play in Winnipeg for your whole career? Because the Ryder fans here are going to be going, why? Why would you stay in Winnipeg? Why? <laughs> what was it like? You know the rivalry with the Riders and the Bombers and all that. But, you know, we've had my friend Graham Bell played a few seasons in, in Winnipeg. Loved it. Loved everything about Winnipeg. you got to tell us at least three or four great stories about Winnipeg and why you would stay there and why you've stay, stuck around to be able to do that. But we'll get into a little bit more about your CFL career. Who are some of the best athletes that you faced and the toughest quarterbacks? You maybe? don't got to say me. <laughs> yeah, no, Definitely I you didn't play me. against him. I didn't do that. But someone, <laughs> I want to know who's some of the best athletes that he came across uh, and, and uh, like that. But we'll get into that right after this. Hi, my name is Rob Peterson. I'm the broker owner of Realty One in Regina. Real estate and life is about great people. And that's why I'm associated with Charleston Hughes and Johan Zielinski and IKS to sponsor the Better With Age podcast. Realty One was founded in Regina 11 years ago. It's an independent brokerage, it's local, and it's full of great people helping great local Regina people buy and sell properties. It's entrepreneurial based, which means you have non-narcissistic agents that have your best interest in mind, not their own. In these coronavirus times, real estate market right now in Regina and Saskatchewan is thriving because people are thinking more local, they're not thinking about traveling because we can't, and that's driving our market. When you hire a realtor, no matter who it is, no matter what company, please interview them. Please make sure they're a good personal fit for you because that's what this is all about. It's good people connecting themselves with someone that they know has their best interest in mind. And that's what the Realty One family does. And that's what a lot of agents in Regina do. But make sure you take your time and find the best fit for you and your family. It's that time of year when divisions are decided, champions are crowned, and legends are born. Now, it's your turn to win big. You've heard the name just about everywhere, my bookie. They're the industry's leading online sportsbook and casino, and it's not hard to understand why. With thousands of lines to bet on all your favorite sports, NFL, NBA, and college ball, check, check, and check. MMA and soccer, they've got all the latest odds, period. Take advantage of MyBookie's prop builder and live in-game betting, where every single run, throw, and touchdown is another chance for you to put cash in your pocket. Visit their mobile-friendly website today and get your deposit matched halfway up to $1,000. Just use the promo code when you make your first deposit. The best part is they make it simple, with a variety of ways to deposit instantly, including credit card, bank transfer, Bitcoin, and more. Whether you're at home or on the go, on your laptop or on your phone, it's not too late to make your New Year's resolution a resolution to get paid. Bet, win, and get paid at my bookie. All right, and we're back here with Mr. Winnipeg, Mr. Doug Brown. Doug, we were chatting before the break about... Um, getting back to normal, right? And we want to get into season. your back to the season. <laughs> back to a season. And, back and to speaking the... of that, that, that jersey in the background, that, uh, that, we got to take that down. We got to change that color. You're, uh, <laughs> you're one back there. Okay. Yeah, we got to no see. No sad we... stuff no more. <laughs> well, good. We got Mr. Winnipeg here to be able to talk about the, how that rivalry. I want to know, Doug, um, you're a BC boy. You tell us a little bit about. I, I want to know first about how it was like as a Canadian going down and playing in the NFL. And you started, you got drafted by the Bills, uh, and then you went to Washington, 
correct? For two seasons. Yeah. How was that like? Tell us a little bit about those days and your days in the NFL and what was that like? I mean, wow, that was a long time ago. So in 1997, I was actually drafted by uh, Calgary, the Stampeders mm -hmm. in the CFL, but I got a free agent opportunity with Buffalo. Uh, that was, as I said, in 97. I spent the entire year in 1997 on the practice squad uh, with Buffalo. And then if you finish the season on the practice squad, you become a, a free agent. And uh, Buffalo had, had an opportunity to go back with them, but I, I got a little more money. Uh, signing bonuses can be very... Uh, uh, alluring when you, especially when you're in college. So I had a little more money up front to sign with Washington. And then, uh, yeah, I made the team in, in 98 and I uh, was able to start nine games in 1998. And then I made the roster again in 1999 and played a bunch more games. And then 2000, I actually broke my foot and I missed the entire season. And then I went back, uh, at the start of 2001, I went back to Washington. Uh, I went to some of their, uh, uh, a mini camp. They had a coaching change. They went from North Turner to Marty Schottenheimer. And, uh, but they were so worried about my foot. They made me sign a waiver and everything. So I didn't think it was going to work out there. And and then that's when I signed my deal and I had my trade from, from Calgary to Winnipeg. And, uh, it was funny. I actually got a call back to go to Washington training camp. Um, but I was already in week two or three of the, the CFL season. Had I known that, uh, so many guys, just were able to opt out of their NFL <laughs> contracts so oh, yeah. sometimes with the NFL. That seemed to be a more uh, recent development. But, no, I have zero regrets in terms of uh, – I think I was very fortunate, very uh, very lucky to play uh, all 11 of my years in Canadian Football League in Winnipeg. Um, it took me a, a while to come around, but uh, in terms of wanting to stay and live here – but one of the things that it didn't take any time was recognizing that it was an environment – where people really cared about their football, uh, super passionate, educated, uh, loyal fan base uh, for the, the Winnipeg Blue Bombers, and and just a crew of uh, just an environment really, I think that uh, made it very hard. And they never gave me a reason to want to go anywhere else. Right, playing football here, uh, obviously the Winnipeg Jets weren't in town at, at that point, and I wasn't playing in the the new unbelievable stadium that they have right now, so. But it was just it was just the best Canadian football environment that I had been exposed to, and uh, my experience here was such uh, first class and, and top shelf. It just made it hard to uh, to think or or uh, consider going elsewhere. Yeah, you sound like a Blue Bomber spokesperson. You see <laughs> yeah. how you're talking about the Blue Bomber? <laughs> what? You don't believe him or what, Charles? Did? What? <laughs> <laughs> oh man, no, that's cool, man. I bet it. I bet it was absolutely weird coming from because you're a tall dude, you're six eight, about three hundred, three twenty when you played. So about six eight, three hundred pounds, going from NFL defensive line, six eight. Most of the guys are around you are probably about six four, six five, six six. So guys are your height. To the CFL, where you, you got a lot of short guys. <laughs> you know, I'm only six foot. So <laughs> there's a big height difference when you're on the field coming from NFL to CFL. Did that, did you have to change your game up coming from uh, the NFL? Because you're dealing with bigger, bigger offensive linemen, offensive linemen that are more like 6'10, you know, 6'9, 340, 350, 360 coming to the CFL. Now, now you're dealing with, Short, stubby little arm, <laughs> offensive lineman. Like, <laughs> like, how did you have to modify your, your game and your pass rush, or what were yeah. you asked to do? Uh, you know, it's funny. Uh, just, uh, uh, just to preface this, uh, there was a time when I was in Winnipeg, and our general manager, Brandon Tamman, was uh, looking uh, for another defensive tackle to play next to me, and they were bringing up the name Jerome Haywood. Yeah. And I said... I didn't know anything about Jerome at the time. And I'm like, please, Brandon, I don't want to be, I don't want the shortest defensive tackle and the tallest defensive tackle to be on the same team. You can't do that. That's ridiculous. And uh, turns out, uh, you know, Jerome uh, Haywood was actually one of my favorite guys to play with because you bring, we bring, we brought such different, vastly different skill sets to the, to the football field that we, we played off each other and uh, it was a fantastic pairing. But at the time I was just like, I couldn't get past the optics of how it would look 
of me and Jerome staying on the field waiting for it. I'm like, the offensive line is going to laugh at us. They're going to be laughing at us because of the height difference, right? But, but Trussell brings up a, a good point. Um, I think the hardest adjustment was definitely the yard off the ball, right? When you've, because uh, I played at Simon Fraser University in, in BC, which was the only school that played American rules. Yeah. So I never played a lick of Canadian football until 2001, until I got to Winnipeg. And uh, when you're a tall guy, you know, you like being right over the ball because, you know, your first step, you're, mm. you're down in your stance already. And all of a sudden, I got a yard before I'm even making contact with anybody and I'm raising up. So, it wasn't so much me worrying about the offensive line in, in, in the CFL. I had to adjust my game. I really had to work on, you know, enhancing my flexibility and, and staying low, trying to get under these guys. I mean, the first guy I ever played against, I think, was Chad Folk for, for Toronto. And he's, man, if he's 5'11", yeah. <laughs> a, a billion dollars in the bank. So yeah. it was, uh, yeah, it was certainly an adjustment, but I would say, the biggest thing was that yard. It, it can, it really serves you, your get off, especially all like I only played one year of uh, high school football. And even that in British Columbia, it was American. So all of my pass rush moves, everything predicated my run defense techniques, everything was predicated on being on top of that football as close as possible. The guy snapping it or in the three technique and to have that change. And all of a sudden I got to take an extra step before I'm clubbing anybody or I'm, I'm just swinging it air. Right. So Charleston understands the, the, the mechanical, uh, uh, just how, how complex and how, how finite it is in terms of adjusting your technique going. He's obviously played in the, in the NFL as well. He's been down there and back up. So he knows how it can throw you, uh, for a loop, right? Just the tiniest little things, just like, <laughs> oh, whoa, yeah. this, Time, timing is everything. <laughs> right. My biggest thing, I used to have this quick swim where I could like try and jump over guys. And there was nobody there in the CFL. I'm jumping over no one. <laughs> yeah. <there. So. laughs> yeah. Luckily, I had long arms, but yeah, it was a, it was a heck of an adjustment. That's a great question, man. Because, um, like you say, I have the utmost respect for guys that have played uh, American football and and have gone back and forth and been able to just play at a high level like Charleston has because it's not easy. It is. There are such different games, but it, it ends up being, that's what we love so much about, about the CFL is because it is so different and, and it is a unique. A lot of guys can only play in the NFL. A lot of guys can only play in the CFL. Mm -hmm. Very few guys can, can go back and forth and, and, and play and, and have success uh, even moderately in, in both leagues. It's uh, because the games are so different and they have such different requirements and uh, and physical attributes you need as an athlete to play to be successful. So you're up here in 2001. Tell us about who are some of the athletes that you're going. Oh wow, this is uh, that guy's tough to be able to get to, or some guys that really top of mind that you were really impressed with that you're going, man, or you know, an offensive lineman, you know, that you're going, okay, um, because we've talked to a few defensive linemen over the last year here. There's some guys that aren't um, going to be on the other guys' Christmas list. Uh, I'll you know, I'll give you an example of that. Is that John Bowman does not like Dominic Picard one bit. He is not going to be sending Dom anything nice for Christmas to do that. But was there anybody in the CFL that you're coming up like, oh, man, this guy's, this guy's a little you know, uh, different to play against? Or is there guys in the quarterbacks that made you go, man, see how quick he is or that really impressed you? Yeah, you know, I think uh, I think initially early on, I think uh, going up against Andrew Green in mm. his prime was uh, he was he was that was a battle. That was something I really look forward to, and uh, he was a monster. In uh, he always took on, always took on the three technique. Was always going to the strong side, the white side of the field, and uh, he was uh, in his prime. He was he was a tremendous, difficult, uh, very good pass ball. He was just very well rounded as an offensive lineman. So in terms of run blocking and, and pass protection. And uh, so, so he was a monster. There's lots of guys. Uh, one of the most freakish athletes, obviously I saw in 2001 when I initially came right into the game was Charlie Roberts. Mm. Uh, I used to call him like the $16 million man. And he asked me the first time, he's like, why did you, why are you calling me a $16 million man? Because I mean, that's how much money you left on the table by not playing in the NFL, you know. Oh. <laughs> oh. <laughs> oh. Uh, 
so unbelievably gifted and blessed. Uh, so much, so much talent. And just not the biggest uh, weight room guy. We'll say it was all God given for for Charlie Roberts. So, uh, you know how t- that's how you like someone when you're in the locker room, right, Charlie? Yeah, the more you yeah. Make fun of someone. The more you rip on them, that's that shows your fondness for them. Oh player, yeah. Right? And, and uh, 2001, the eye, the other thing that that made my eyes pop out of my head. I didn't know who Milt Stiegel was until I got to, to Winnipeg. In fact, the only thing I knew about Winnipeg was I think like they were, the internet was just coming around in, in, in early in late nineties and in the early two thousands. And so I'm like Google searching the Winnipeg blue bombers. And I'd never, even though I'd grown up in BC, I'd never been to Manitoba or, or been to Winnipeg before. And I remember, I'm like, who is this giant, Viking looking man that, that looks oh, like he's Walby. Uh, yeah, it was Walby, right? Like, <laughs> Walby was the only association I had with what Winnipeg was and the Winnipeg Blue Bombers. I was like, it's Chris Walby. Like that's that's all I knew. I, I thought I had to bring a two handed battle axe or something if I was coming <laughs> because he was the welcoming figure. But uh, uh Milt Stiegel was a guy I didn't know anything about and I got here and Dave Ritchie was our coach and and I couldn't believe the very first meeting I was in, I couldn't believe the rapport he had or, or the, uh, the ability he had to talk back. Like we have a, a head coach, as Charleston knows, when a head coach is talking in the National Football League, you can hear a pin drop. Guys are not, you know, you're in a hall, da 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 da. And Dave Ritchie was saying things and Milt was correcting him and interrupting <laughs> him and saying, no, that no, Dave. I don't think we're going to do that kind of thing. And I was like, "Who is running this football team?" I can... <laughs> but uh, that was why uh, that, that showed me two things. Obviously, I was like, "This Milt Stiegel must be a hell of a player." Turns out he was because he can get away with talking to coach like that. But uh, Dave Ritchie had such a great relationship with his coaches, uh, with his players, that uh, you know Milt wasn't. Uh, uh, you know, he was able to have that that great casual friendship association even though dave would take us to task when things weren't going well it was just a unique relationship i'd never seen uh between a a coach and a player in a professional setting before it was so relaxed and they were so um uh, informal with each other it was just i was like this is a this is a cool special vibe and and a place to be playing football right now so oh wow that's crazy you (laughs) get that thought process right there doug is going okay you're new to winnipeg you get in you get settled in with the guys what was your thought process then for the first time you came to regina and you had a labor day game here then (laughs) because that's got to be a story right there then right yeah i mean it, it doesn't start off well because we we were taking a bus and I was like, <laughs> never taken a bus to a pro football game before. What are you doing taking a bus? <laughs> McDonald's and Brandon. I was like, I don't know. I was like, this is weird. And, and this is, uh, we used to, at that point, we went through the phase of we were staying in Regina, right, right close to the field. And then we went away and we went to that spa. It was in a moose Yeah. Like yeah. Yeah. And then we ended up coming back. And but um, initially, I don't know, going to Saskatchewan, you did hear you knew it was going to be a different game, right? Because you you know, you don't have to be in Winnipeg long to understand the their prairie rivalry. And uh, it was just all as soon as you pulled into town in your buses, you know, I was like, okay, this is this, it gets your attention in a hurry. You're like, this is going to be very different from any other game I've been I've played so far in 2001. And uh, it was it was unique. It was it was a college atmosphere, right? It was chaos. It was there were people that shouldn't have been in our hotel that were in our hotel. <laughs> there was horns. There was people calling your room at all times. It really made us angry. We actually did very well. My first few years going out to Labor Day, we were so angry because of all the the way their fans were interrupting us and and calling us and <laughs> in our like they had rooms right next to ours and stuff in the hotel and. It was, uh, yeah, it was, it was like, you get a phone call in your room, like three o'clock in the morning, the night before the game. And I'm just like, it was, uh, it was crazy. <laughs> it really but I was like, this is, this is something else. This is a circus down here. This is a carnival. But that's, you know, the thing, obviously, uh, Winnipeg and, and Saskatchewan, very two distinct places, but the passion and the enthusiasm for Canadian football and, and, you know, how, 
how people love the game. It's a, that's exactly the same, right? So it was great to see you go in there and you play another team where you're so similar, you hate each other, right? That's how it is. <laughs> yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. Versus Castro, and we're Manitoba. Neither one of us wants to admit that we've got a lot of things in common, <laughs> and so we're so trying so hard to be different. We're going to hate each other because of that. Right. And uh, I made for great games though. Like, and that's all you want. You just want to play in places where people care, where people care about their football team in Saskatchewan, and, like nobody's business. And obviously they do the same in Manitoba as well. So it doesn't matter whether the fans there loved you, hated you. Too. It just, it was awesome because of the atmosphere and the environment and you could feed mm. off of it. And it, I want, it was, I want to, so it was basically crazy. deep inside, but, Deep inside somewhere, you're telling me right now that you really want to play for Sad somewhere, <laughs> somewhere in there. Stir in the pot, stir in the pot. I, it, I could <laughs> yeah. just, I could just sense it. I could, uh, I could just feel it. Like, yeah, I kind of want to be, I want to be a rough rider. I, I definitely respected their football environment uh, <laughs> and their passion for the game and and how they felt about their football team. I, I was certainly, I was like, this is a you know, you recognize as a player that that's a good place to go and, and but you're not going to get lost in the mix out there. And they take the football very seriously. And a lot of the fans are, are educated nowhere near to the extent that Winnipeg and Manitoba fans are. But you <laughs> there know, you go. Next level, next level down. Next yeah. Level down right underneath, you know. So it's like uh, the Saskatchewan fans all have, uh, you know, bachelors of arts. And the, the Winnipeg Blue Bomber fans are all doctorates and master's oh, degrees. Wow. Here, so. oh, wow. <laughs> Throwing just in the digs so now. Yeah, yeah. Just so graceful. Oh, I hated football. Just <laughs> love. Yeah. Oh, is. Nobody is going to be sending anybody from Saskatchewan is not going to be sending Doug Brown any Christmas cards anytime <laughs> yeah. soon. That's for sure after this show. <laughs> Charleston, what was it like then for you on the other side when you were playing on the Riders going into Winnipeg? What was that reaction like? I know that we've talked to a few players about that, but what was your what do you remember when you're playing in in Winnipeg for the uh yeah, man, it's just Banjo Bowl? It's just the fans. It's, it's with, Winnipeg is one of the, the, are the only stadiums that you go into. And, and, and I think in Regina, it's kind of the same, same way, where you can go to that stadium and the fans are right, right there behind you, sitting really, really, really close to your bench. And it's like <laughs> they do it on purpose. So, like, the people can yell at you. They can almost grab you if you, too, <laughs> if you bag up too far. <laughs> and it's always the one guy with that... I can't remember that uniform. It's like an Ultimate Warrior type uniform on, and he got a banjo or something in his hand. And <laughs> the fans are nuts <laughs> like that. Like the Winnipeg fans, I know it's like they try to be so angry and mad and just as vicious as possible. <laughs> and you just, I don't know, man. It's just they're, they're crazy. <laughs> they're just as crazy. Hostile. Yeah, it's it's pretty hostile. It's a little hostile environment, but I think more more of the reason is because those fans are like right there, and they and they get. Direct access to yelling at you after a play, cussing you out, doing their hardest to get your attention. So it's like, and they're the only fans that do that. So then, does that, like Doug said, did that get you more motivated to, to you know, to, to beat up on Winnipeg, or were you just, were, did it throw you off your game at all? Yeah, because you know, if you put it on the team, you know the fans gonna shut up. <laughs> <laughs> So, yeah. Put it on the team. Man. Yeah, you know, if you go in and you and you just put it on them in the first half, and then you go, then you can go. Now I can go back and start barking and bantering the fans. Like, ah, oh, I don't hear you now. <laughs> Come on, say something now. Talk now. Yeah. All right, all right. Well, you got to admit, the worst is that like you go on the road. So I'm in Saskatchewan, or you're in Winnipeg. And you, you hear the noise, right, from the fans, and, and they're always chirping, they're always saying stuff. And you always just want to, you know, pretend like you don't, you don't hear it, no reaction, whatever. But every now and then, somebody says something so funny oh. either about you. Or <laughs> you try not to laugh because you don't want to laugh in in, in the visiting, and and you don't want to respond to the fans. But oh man, I couldn't. Sometimes, sometimes the fans would come up with something they would say, whether it was about me or one of my teammates I was sitting next to on the bench. And you never want to give them the satisfaction that they've affected you, good, bad, or ugly. But, yeah. oh, man, sometimes <laughs> things you hear them say. And usually it was about oh, some of the things I heard them say about Wade Miller, like Troy Westwood or something. Oh, my God. I would just be sitting there like trying not, <laughs> trying not, not to. 
and laugh and re- there because if you laugh, if you show any emotion or, or you're triggered in any way, yeah. then you're then encouraging. They, then they, right? yeah, then they, they know they hear you. So yeah. <laughs> then they freak off that, right? So you can't. You can uh, you can't give him any attention. Yeah, but man, man, I, I man, remember a fan. Uh, I remember a fan <laughs> did something like that to me, man. The same way, where I remember just sitting there, and you know, it was in between plays, and it, it got pitched like quiet on the field, like nobody was cheering, nobody was saying nothing, and then some lady yells out, "I want to have your babies, Charleston!" <laughs> And I'm turning around, we all, and then the whole entire building turn around and look like, what the hell? Like, <laughs> you're like, oh lord! <laughs> it is like one of those. About, man. Oh man, the craziest, the craziest fans. Yeah, but, yeah. You hear something like that on the field, and then it just breaks all silence, and everybody just busts out <laughs> laughing and deals. just turn around and look. Yeah, that's <laughs> awesome. That's well, that's the CFL for you. I mean, you can literally the one thing I love about the cfl is that you really feel like doug said too that college atmosphere you feel like you get to know these things and one of the things we were talking about before that we'll quickly mention here was that doug you do uh, so much work in the community for these different charities and i think that's one of the best things about the cfl is that we get to really be involved with these players and and uh guys like charleston what i've known about charleston is that you know he cares so much about the community and the the different um, charities like the YWCA that he's associated with or uh, all the different indigenous groups that Charleston's out going to these schools and spending so much of his free time, you know, that he's not putting out uh, and getting out in the media. He's doing this on his own to be able to help better these kids and doing that. And you were a big part of that too in Winnipeg and can continue to do that. How is that going to, you know, uh, change for you now in the next upcoming future? Because you really haven't been able to do that for for the last, you know, year, 18 months, probably. Um, Ed, do you have anything upcoming in the future and, and anything that you're going to be doing, hopefully now and in, in the next uh, little bit? Yeah, for sure. You know, Charleston is one of those players that he got that perspective. He understands that the community supports him and what he does for a living. And so it is, it, it's your best interest as a player. You got to give back to people that, uh, you know, uh, support you and, and, uh, provide you with the livelihood of being a professional athlete. Well, the the, la- the least you can do as, as an athlete is, uh, is, is give back. So I uh, just, uh, things that I think that really were affected, uh, uh, in, in a significant way from the pandemic. I work with one group called, uh, motion ball, motionball.ca. And it's, uh, it's a charity event that is run uh, in many cities across Canada, and they raise money for the Special Olympics uh, Foundation of Canada. And that was uh, there's a day of sport where you get uh, paired up with uh, a Special Olympic athlete, and you know in Winnipeg uh, they're raising over a hundred thousand dollars in one day of of this activity that we do. And I bring a bunch of uh, old retired players out, and we pair up with a Special Olympic athlete, and we just have a great time. Uh, through all these competitions. So I really feel like, uh, you know, motionball.ca and those special Olympic athletes, it wasn't just professional athletes like Charleston and and the rest of guys in the CFL that didn't get to compete and participate in sport uh, last year because of cancellations and the pandemic. It was uh, special athletes like this that also, that's what they live for. That's what, uh, that's what these kids look forward to on an annual basis is what they're able to do. They understand you know, high level sport and, you know, how that impacts you and, uh, really changes your life. So, um, any, uh, any attention anyone can pay to, you know, go on that website, go, go to motionball.ca, see how you can make a donation and help out these kids for special Olympics, because those are, those are some athletes too, that had all their programming and everything taken away from them. And, uh, hopefully with the way the vaccination rates are going and, and things are opening up that uh, hopefully these kids uh, can get their programming back in a hurry because uh, you want to talk about uh, a devastating effect on a very special group of of, of kids that are uh, supreme athletes that, that deserve to uh, you know play sport and 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 show their talents on on a field as well. Yeah, that's awesome. That's a great cause, and we'll definitely be looking into that. And uh, Doug, we wanted to say. Um Thank you. Thank you for coming on the show and, and talking about this. I feel like you're a guy 
that we could go for a few beers with and there'd be about two hours worth of stories that you could sit there and tell <laughs> us about the boys and the time. And it feels like you guys had a good culture in Winnipeg and a good group of guys and the stories that, like I said, the Charlie Roberts stories, I've, I've heard a few of them from my friend Graham Bell and, and uh, Stiegel and, and it seemed like you guys just were a good, a good fit there and you got probably a ton of stories. Hey, had I known more about this show, it would have been, I would have had a beer and I would have been drinking it while <laughs> There you go. Have me back. Now that I know how you guys roll. Yeah, right? next time, roll, next you know, time. Well, and drink. episode I, round shows two. like this. You know, gotta watch my P's and my Q's and what I'm saying and everything <laughs> like that. And, and uh, you guys go free. You're a little, loosen things up here. So, uh, yeah, next time. There you go. We'll virtual beer. We're going to have virtual beers the next time you're in Regina. Hopefully, uh, I'll be buying your first few beers for you, that's for sure, and be able to do that. So we want to say thank you very much for coming thank on. Thank you, thank you. Good luck with everything in motionball.ca. Motion.ca, motionball.ca. That's, yeah. Motionball. Good luck with everything in Winnipeg. Like I said, you're a Mr. Winnipeg. You represent Winnipeg with lots of pride and passion. And not only that, the CFL, you can tell that you've – um, you know, you had a great career there, but um, you're very passionate about the CFL, and, and that's great. That's uh, awesome. Even as an Argo fan, I respect that, and I salute you. So thank you very much for that. We always end the show with uh, Charleston's wise words to to our guests, so I'll turn it over to him. That was awesome, man. Thanks for, uh, for coming on the show and doing this, man. This was uh, definitely a pleasure. I don't even know if we ever ever said two words to each other before this. <laughs> Right yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. But you know what? You, yeah, friends. Yeah, Charles, had known, we got along like this. We would have talked way more. You know, 2008, 9, 10, 11. You know. But yeah, that's what I said. Yeah. <laughs> but you know what? That does that does show who, the per, the type of person you are, though. Because even though kind of knew of each other, you know, as athletes, and never really, you know, engaged or crossed paths before, but sent you a message, you answered right away. So that does let me know that, you know, you're a stand-up type of guy and a human being, and thanks for coming on the show. But <clears throat> this is the Better With Age webcast. The reason we call this the Better With Age webcast is because there's many things that get better with age. There's wine, there's whiskey, there's cheese, there's leather. But the most important thing of them all is friendships. So now we finally get a chance to meet each other. Hi, nice to meet you. I'm Charleston. <laughs> I'm done, man. Oh, we'll well, see you around. See you around. <laughs> you're, you're a friend of ours for life now. Thanks for having me on the show, guys. You guys do a great program here. This is a lot of fun. So it's yeah. fantastic. Thank you for having me. Beers on us next time, Dougie. All the best to you. All right, guys. Thank you very much. Later. <laughs>